We've now successfully learned how to create a Docker image in order to run Redis on our machine locally. But there's still a lot to learn about creating an image in running Docker applications. So in this section, we're going to kick off a new project. The goal of this project is to create a tiny Node.js web application, wrap it inside of a Docker container, and then be able to access that web application from a browser running on your local machine. We're not going to worry about deploying this app right now. We're just focused on getting Node.js to work inside of a Docker container. Let me first begin by showing you a quick outline of some of the steps that we're going to go through. So the first thing we have to do is create an actual Node.js web application. Now, if you don't have any experience with Node.js and you're more of a Java person or Ruby or whatever it might be, that is totally fine. The code that we're going to write for the JavaScript side of things is totally optional. So you can either watch the video where, where we will put together the server, or you can entirely skip it, and you can just download the single file or one or two files that you're going to need. So if you don't know anything about Node.js, no problem whatsoever. After we create the Node.js web app, we'll then author a Docker file. We're going to make a Docker file to create an image that is going to be used to run our web server inside of a container. So we're going to build the image from the Docker file. We will run the image as a container on our local machine, and then we will make sure that we are able to connect to that running web application inside the container from our browser. Now, last thing I want to mention here, and this might be, might be something that makes you a little bit unhappy, but I'm just going to throw a disclaimer out here. We're going to do some things in this project a little bit wrong. So when we put together our Docker file, we're going to make a couple of mistakes. And we're doing this very much on purpose because these are going to be some mistakes that I really expect you to make when you start working on Docker on your own projects. So I want you to see these mistakes. I want you to see the error messages and I want you to learn how to fix them. So just quick disclaimer, you know, again, we're going to do things just a little bit wrong. Don't worry. I will be very clear when we come across an error and I will say, very, very clearly, hey, we did this on purpose, here's the mistake, and here is how to fix it. I know that sometimes in a tutorial, it's really frustrating when things are done incorrectly. I'm totally aware of that, so I'm gonna make sure that these errors are as distinct and highlighted as possible. All right, so with that in mind, let's take a quick break. When we come back to the next section, we're gonna start putting together this Node.js web application. So I'll see you in just a minute. In this section, we're going to start working on the Node.js web application. If you are not familiar with Node.js or you don't know any JavaScript and you don't want to know any JavaScript, that is totally fine. You can pause the video right now, skip to the next section where I will have a text link for you to download the two files that you're going to need. So totally fine if you don't want to write any JavaScript at all. Otherwise, stick around and we'll get started on this tiny web application. So to get started, I'm going to first flip back over to my terminal you'll notice that I'm still inside of that Redis image directory. I'm gonna go up one directory, and then I'll make a new project folder, and we will call this, how about simple web? Because it's going to be a rather simple, straightforward web application. I'll then change into that directory, and then I'm going to again, start up my code editor inside there. Now, quick reminder, I was able to use the code command right here because I've set up Visual Studio Code to be executed from my command line. So if you don't have that set up, totally fine. All you really need to do right now is open up your code editor based on that simple web directory that we just created. Then inside of here, we're going to create first a file called package.json. Inside this file, we're going to put together a little bit of configuration to describe how our node application is going to work exactly. I'm going to first begin by placing a set of curly braces. And then inside there, I'm going to place a key wrapped in double quotes. And the first section we're going to put together is going to list out all of the different dependencies that our application needs to run correctly. Notice how I'm wrapping the word dependencies inside of a set of double quotes. I've got a colon afterwards, and then I open up a curly brace object. Then inside that set of curly braces, I will put down another set of double quotes. And I'm going to say that in order for our application to work correctly, we need a copy of Express. I'll then put down a colon. And then for the version, I'm just going to put a star to say we can use any version of Express out there. We don't care. After that, I'm then going to put a comma on this line right here. And then I'll add in one more section. This is going to be a section that we will call scripts. 
and this will contain some of the different scripts that you can run to get our application up and running. I'm going to open up another set of curly braces, just like we did a second ago. I'll put a set of double quotes, and we're going to create a script called start. Anytime that someone runs the start script, we are going to execute node index.js, like so. This right here is going to be what ultimately starts up our server and gets it running. All right, so that's it inside of the package.json file. So we have specified a dependency and we've created a single script. I'm now gonna make sure that I save the file and then I'm going to close it and create a second file inside the same directory. And the second file I will call index.js. So inside of here, we're gonna first begin by requiring in the express library that we just marked as a dependency. I'll then use the express library to create a new app, like so. And then we're, we are going to set up one single route handler. We're gonna say app.get. I'll pass in a string with a forward slash. As a second argument, I'll pass in an arrow function that gets called with a request and response object and open up a function body after placing a function arrow. Then inside of here, we'll do res.send and we're gonna send back a message of hi there. So now anytime someone visits the root route of our application, we are going to immediately send back a string that says simply hi there. And so ultimately when we run our application, my expectation is that in the browser, we should be able to visit this running web application and see hi there appear on the screen. Now the last thing we have to do is set up our application to listen on a port. So down at the bottom of the file, I'll say app.listen, and I'll specify the port that we are going to be listening to as 8080. As a second argument, I'll pass in an arrow function like so. And then finally, after the app starts listening to this port correctly, we will print out a little message that says listening on port 8080, like so. And then I'm going to make sure that I save this file. All right, so that's pretty much it. We've got our package.json file that de defines some configuration around our project. And we've got the index.js file that contains the actual server logic. So we're gonna take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're gonna start talking about how we're going to put together our Docker file. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we put together the core of the Node.js web application. If you didn't follow along in the last section and you just coffee pasted the code, just make sure that you've got your index.js file and a package.json file. You'll also want to make sure that you've got your terminal open inside of your project directory. And so if I list out my current files and folders, I should see the index.js and package.json files. Okay, so we've got some source code here and now we need to figure out how we can wrap this all up inside of a Docker container. I want to first begin by telling you a little bit about Node.js and how we're going to start up this application. So just in case you've never made use of Node before, two commands that you need to be aware of to install dependencies and start up this application. Anytime that we want to start up a Node app, we have to first install a set of dependencies. And we can install all of our dependencies by running a command npm install inside of our project directory. This starts up a little program called npm, which is somewhat colloquially known as the node package manager. This is going to run that program and install a couple of dependencies for us. And of course it assumes that npm is installed on our local machine or inside the container as the case may be. The other thing to be aware of is that we're going to have to eventually start our server up. And to do so, we're going to run the command npm start at the terminal as well. And again, this also kind of assumes that NPM is already installed. All right, so with all this in mind, let's now start thinking about the Docker file that we have to put together. Now, the series of operations that we are gonna put into the Docker file is going to end up looking very similar to what we did in the last application. So in this somewhat complicated diagram, our template that we're kind of following here for our Docker file is to specify a base image run some command to install some dependencies, which definitely sounds like something we have to do, and then specify the command to run on startup, which as we just discussed is that npm start thing. Now over when we were working on the Redis image, we said from Alpine to specify the base image, we ran apk add redis to install the dependency, and then we set up the default command as redis server. And so it really seems like we have some very direct parallels this time around. 
I think that for the node application, we could probably do a Docker file that specifies Alpine as our base image. We can then run npm install to install all of our dependencies, and then we can set up the default command of npm start to run the server when the container first comes online. So we're gonna take this type of approach right here by creating a Docker file and then essentially putting almost exactly these instructions inside of it. Now, quick disclaimer, just quick disclaimer here. Remember I had said we're gonna do a few things here slightly wrong, just so you can see some very common error messages that you are just about guaranteed to see on your own personal projects. So maybe in this discussion or the series of steps that I just described, there might be something in here that doesn't quite line up with what's reality or what we really have to do, okay? All right, so let's get started. I'm going to begin by making sure I've got my code editor open based on that simple web directory. And inside of here, I'm gonna make a new Docker file. Remember, it's Docker with a capital D, and there is no file extension on there. Then inside of here, we're going to first specify our base image. And just to be really complete, I'm gonna add in some comments for these steps, just to remind you what we're doing every step along the way. So I'll say specify a base image. And you know what, let's use that Alpine image again. It really seemed like it worked out last time for us. Next up, we're going to install some dependencies. To do so, we will run the command npm install. Like I just said, the npm install command is how we install dependencies on a Node.js project. And then finally, we will set up a default command, which we can do by running out cmd. And then we put down a set of square brackets. And then in a set of double quotes, we separately list out all the parts of the command that we want to run when the container is first created. And so to start up our server, we are probably going to want npm start, like so. Notice that I've got a comma between those two strings. All right, I think this looks pretty good. It definitely looks very similar to what we did for Redis. So let's now flip back over to our terminal and see what happens when we try to build this image. So I'm gonna list out my files and folders and verify that I now see the Docker file inside of here. And then remember to build an image, we can run docker build and then we put the dot in there to specify the build context of the current directory. So I'll run that. And then we very quickly see npm not found. All right, so first problem of a couple that we're going to see. So let's take a quick pause right here. We're going to start to investigate why we are seeing this error and fix it up. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we took a first stab at our Docker file to build out this Node.js project but we very quickly saw that during the run npm install step, we got an error message that said npm not found. We're seeing this error message because during step number two right here, where we tried to execute the command npm install inside of a temporary container, there is no copy of npm available. We're seeing this because we are using Alpine as our base image. Remember, we had said that we select our base image based upon the collection of default programs that we need to successfully build our image. By default, Alpine is a very small image. It's only about five megabytes large. And so it has a rather limited set of default programs included inside of it. In fact, I kind of like this diagram right here. What programs are included in the Alpine image? Well, this is supposed to be a tumbleweed of sorts. Not much. So there's not a whole lot of stuff going on by default inside the Alpine image you get a couple of very default Linux or Unix programs. You get that package manager that we used just a little bit ago, but that's pretty much it. You don't get a lot of other stuff for free. So when you are using the Alpine image and you expect to run some fancy web application depending upon Node.js or depending upon Ruby or Java, chances are you are gonna have to do some additional fixes or some additional setup to get this thing working. Now to solve this issue, to solve the issue of NPM not being available inside of our base image, we have two options. The first option is to find a different base image. We can try to find a base image that already has Node and NPM pre-installed inside of it. Alternatively, we can continue using the Alpine image and run an additional command, like right here, to attempt to install Node.js and NPM inside of our image. So two approaches, we can either essentially use someone else's work or we can try to build up our own image from scratch. 
In our case, we're going to try using someone else's image. We're going to find an image that has already been configured to have NPM pre-installed inside of it. So to get started, I'm going to flip back over to my terminal and we're going to navigate to Docker Hub, which you'll recall is a repository of public images that we can easily pull into our build process. So I'm going to open up a new tab and navigate to hub.docker.com. And then on the top bar, I'm going to find the Explore button. You'll see a listing of very popular images immediately appear. And so of course, right there is Alpine. We're going to scroll down a little bit and a few options down, you'll see Node listed right here. If you don't see Node listed on here, you can always do a search up here at the top left-hand side. And we're essentially just looking for the repository called Node, and it should have a little sub-description of official. So we can click on this. We'll get a short description right here. Now, the description in this case is not super helpful. It says, oh yeah, Node.js, here's what it is. But well, what are we really downloading? Like, what is this repository? This repository is a Docker image that has Node pre-installed on it. So if we want to, we can attempt to build our image based upon this Node one. And this Node image already has Node pre-installed, already has NPM pre-installed, and so we don't have to worry about getting more errors like this where NPM is not found. Now before we just go and use Node willy-nilly, I want to show you a little bit more inside this description. So you'll see this full description panel right here. And then first section in here is supported tags and respective Docker file links. So this is a listing of all the different versions of this image that is available. You can get different versions of Node.js encapsulated in each of these different tags. So for example, if I have an application that requires Node version 6.14, I can find the tagged version 6.14 right here. And then inside of my Docker file, when I specify my base image, I can say Node, and I can specify the version of it specifically by adding on 6.14. So this will give me an image that contains a pre-installed version of Node.js, specifically version 6.14 of Node.js. Now in our case, we don't want version 6.14. Instead, I want you to scroll around just a little bit, and you'll eventually see one tag in here called Alpine. You might have to do a Command F search for Alpine, and you'll see that, well, yeah, there's a lot of examples on it on here. So here's Alpine right here. I want you to remember this is a tag, so this is not the name of the repository. So when you see Alpine right here, it doesn't mean that we're supposed to use like Alpine like we were just before. The first word right here is the name of the repository. You place a colon, and then you put down a tag name. And so in this case, when you see Alpine right here, it means that we can optionally select node colon Alpine. So now you might be curious, why would we do this? Like, what is the purpose of Alpine being tied onto node? Well, Alpine is a term in the Docker world for an image that is as small and compact as possible. Many popular repositories are going to offer Alpine versions of their image. And an Alpine version of Node in particular means that you're not going to get a bunch of additional pre-installed programs. So the default Node installation might include extra programs like, say, Git or a package manager or, I don't know, some fancy text editing tools inside that image. When you get the Alpine version of an image, it means you're getting the absolute most stripped down version of that image possible. So it's going to essentially have Node.js and pretty much nothing else. It will have some very basic programs like, say, the ping command, maybe. You know, you have to look at the actual image to figure that out, but it might have the ping command. You'll have, say, cat, maybe a simple text editor, ls, simple programs like that. But in general, you're getting a very stripped down version of that image. So for us, the Alpine version works just fine because essentially all you and I need is Node and NPM. And NPM is included in this node image right here. And we need absolutely nothing else. So we are totally fine using the Alpine version of the node image. All right, so with all that in mind, now that we've made the change to the from right here, we now have specified a base image that hopefully is going to include NPM inside of it. And I can tell you, it, it definitely is. This is going to have NPM pre-installed. We're definitely good to go. So let's now try to rebuild our image with this change and see if that error message goes away. 
First things first, do make sure that you save the Docker file. And then once you save it, we'll flip back over to the terminal and do a docker build dot again. All right, so now you can see that we're downloading the new node Alpine image. We then get down to step number two right here where we run npm install, but very shortly after that, we get a series of error messages. And the first of which says, no such file or directory package.json. So the package.json is a file that exists inside of our current working directory. But it looks like the container is complaining that, hey, I don't have this file available. Like, where's the package.json file? I need this to know which dependencies I need to install. So let's take a quick pause right here. And we're going to start to investigate why we're seeing this error message. In the last section, we made a little change to our Docker file and then tried rebuilding the image. The good news is that NPM is now clearly being included inside of our container. And so it's attempting to install dependencies. However, NPM itself very quickly threw out a error message right here, complaining that there is no file called package.json available. Now, just in case you weren't around or you kind of skipped over the section where we put together the package.json file together, that is a file inside of our project directory right here. Its purpose is to list out all the different dependencies that are required to successfully run our project. So when we run NPM install, NPM is going to try to find this file it's going to find all the dependencies that are listed, and then it's going to try to install each of those. So clearly the issue here is that NPM is not finding that file. So let's talk about why it is. All right, so quick diagram. We've looked at this one before. We've got our container on the right-hand side. We've got the steps out of our Docker file. And then down here is a little representation of the node Alpine image that we're making use of. So let's imagine what is going on inside of our image building process right now. First off, we specify node Alpine. That downloads the Alpine image, or excuse me, the node image to be precise. And then the next step starts up and it says, okay, I'm gonna go back to the previous step and get the image from there and then create a temporary container out of it. So as soon as run npm install starts to boot up, we can imagine that we take this file system snapshot right here and we kind of put it into this very temporary container. And then we execute npm install. Now, I want, got a quick question for you. Do you see anywhere inside of this file system right here, do you see a package.json file? Well, the answer is no. There is no package.json file available inside of the container. The only files and folders that are available inside the container is exactly whatever came out of the file system snapshot from the node image. Remember, we are only working with a segment of our hard drive inside this container. There's this entire other rest of the hard drive kind of like not connected inside this container. And somewhere inside the rest of the hard drive is where our package.json file is. And that is not at all being communicated into the container. And so we do successfully run npm install, but there just plain is no package.json file available. So the takeaway here is that when you are building an image, none of the files inside of your project directory right here are available inside the container by default. They are all 100% sectioned off, completely segmented out. They are not at all available, and you cannot assume that any of these files are available unless you specifically allow it inside of your Docker file. So as you might guess, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to add in one line of configuration to our Docker file to make sure that both our index.js file and package.json file are available inside the container when we try to run the npm install command. Let's take a quick pause right here, and then we're going to add in that additional instruction in the next section. In the last section, we saw that the npm install command failed to run because the package.json file was not found, and we spoke about why that was. In this section, we're going to figure out how we can make sure that the package.json file is available before npm install is executed inside of the container. To do so, we're going to add one little instruction to our Docker file. This is going to be an instruction that we've not used before. It's the copy instruction. And as you might guess, the copy instruction is used to move files and folders from our local file system on your machine to the file system inside of that temporary container that is created during the build process. The overall syntax for this is copy, then a path to the folder on your local file system, and then the path that you want to copy that stuff to inside the container. 
Right now, I'm showing these commands with a dot slash, which means the current working directory. Now, one little technicality here, the path from our folder, the first argument right here, is relative to the build context. And you'll recall that I had said that the build context is the dot right here when we execute Docker build at the terminal. So build right here means simple web directory or the current working directory. So we have set the current build context to be simple web. So then inside the copy command right here, when I say dot slash, that means the build context, which is simple web. I know that's a little bit confusing. It's essentially kind of like two layers of indirection. Again, we're gonna see a better example of why we would alter this build context stuff in the future when we start working on some more complicated projects. For right now, all we really need to know is that if we add this right here to our Docker file, we're gonna copy everything from our current working directory into the container, and that's pretty much it. So let's flip over to our Docker file, and we're gonna add in this instruction and then try to rebuild our image. Now we definitely want to make sure that the package.json file is available before we run npm install. So I'm going to add in the new instruction right above that. So I'll say copy dot slash dot slash. Again, everything from the current working directory of simple web to the current working directory inside the container. All right, so I'm going to save this and then we're going to try to run the docker build command again over at our terminal. So I'm going to flip back over and I'll do docker build dot. We'll run that. Now between the last section and this one, I removed my Alpine image or the node Alpine image. So I had to redownload it. But after that, we should see the copy step. There it is right there. We'll then see npm install. Now you will notice a couple of little warnings. The warnings are totally fine. If you see a notice and then three warnings in a row, that's totally fine. No issue. So we've now successfully installed all of our NPM dependencies. And then if we keep on scrolling down, we'll eventually see at the bottom that we have correctly generated this new image. And this is the ID of the new image. Now, remember, it's not really nice to work with IDs all the time. Let's try running the docker build command again, but this time we're going to tag the image. So I'll say docker build dash T, then my docker ID, and then the name of this project which we are calling simple web. And then I'm gonna make sure that I pass in the build context on the very end. You'll notice I did not put on the colon latest to the tag right there. It's because remember the colon latest tag is automatically appended if you don't specify it in here. Now, one thing I just wanna remind you about, please don't forget the dot on the very end. And once you've got that all on there, we'll hit enter to rebuild it. And now we have tagged that newly built image as your Docker ID slash simple web. So now the last thing we're going to do is try to start out that image and get the node server running. So I'll do a docker run Steven Greider slash simple web. All right, so I very quickly see that the node index.js command was issued through the npm start command. I then see that the server is correctly listening on port 8080. So I think that we're ready to open up a web browser and test this thing out. So I'm gonna flip on over to my browser and to visit that running application, we should be able to go to localhost colon 8080. But once I do, I get a nasty little error message that says this site can't be reached. Well, we definitely got our image built and we are running a container out of it, but we still are not able to actually visit this port or see the web application running. So let's take a quick pause right here and we'll continue in the next section and figure out what is going wrong. In the last section, we were able to successfully build our image and then start up our container based on it. We saw the message listening on port 8080, but when we actually tried to visit localhost 8080 inside the browser, we got a pretty nasty error message. So let's figure out what went wrong and how to fix it. All right, so here's a diagram of what's happening right now. Our browser is making a request to localhost 8080, which is essentially a reference to your current machine on port 8080. By default, no traffic that is coming into your computer or into your local host network is routed into the container. So the container essentially has its own isolated set of ports that can receive traffic. But by default, no incoming traffic to your computer is going to be directed into the container. In order to make sure 
that any request from either your computer or some outside computer will be redirected into the container, we have to set up a explicit port mapping. A port mapping essentially says any time that someone makes a request to a given port on your local network, take that request and automatically forward it to some port inside the container. So in other words, if anyone makes a request to localhost 8080, take that request, automatically forward it into the container on port 8080, where the node application can then receive it and process the request and eventually respond to it. Now, one thing that I wanna make sure is really clear right now from the get-go, this is only talking about incoming requests. Your Docker container can, by default, make requests on its own behalf to the outside world. We've already seen that in action anytime that you've been installing a dependency. When we ran npm install during the Docker build process just a moment ago, npm reaches to the outside world. It reaches out across the internet. And so there's no limitation by default on your container's ability to reach out. It's strictly a limitation on the ability for incoming traffic to get in to the container. So in order to set up this mapping, in order to kind of forward this traffic to a specific port inside the container, we're going to make a slight adjustment to the way in which we start the container up, or specifically the docker run command. So this is not a change that we're going to make to the docker file. We do not set up port forwarding inside the docker file. The port forwarding stuff is strictly a runtime constraint. In other words, it's something that we only change when we run a container or start a container up. So here's what we're going to do. To set up Docker run with port mapping, we're going to add on a dash p flag. The syntax overall is Docker run, then dash p, then we're going to specify that any incoming traffic on our local network to this port right here should be automatically forwarded onto this port inside the container right here. And notice how there's a separation between these two ports or these two numbers of a colon. And then as usual, after that, we're gonna specify either the image ID or the image name, which is what we are now using. So let's flip over to our terminal and we're going to give this a quick shot. I'm gonna first stop the running container by pressing Control C. And then I'm going to start the container back up but this time I'm gonna set up some port mapping. So I'll say anytime a request comes in to 8080 on my local machine, redirect it to port 8080 inside the container. And then I'll make sure that I still specify the image that I want to use for this container as my Docker ID. You'll put whatever yours is right there, simple web. And I'm gonna get that on to just one line, like so. Okay, so let's start this. Now from the outside, it looks like everything is still identical to how it was before, but if you flip on over to your browser, open up a new tab again, and go to localhost 8080, you'll very quickly see the text hi there appear on the screen. This is the response that we would expect to see from the running node application. So that means that we are now correctly forwarding incoming requests into the container. The node application is processing the request and then sending a response back out. So that's pretty much it. That is port mapping in a nutshell. Now very quickly, one last little thing that I want to show you because this will be done very frequently on real projects. The port from the source machine or the source network that we are mapping from to the port that we are mapping to inside the container do not have to be identical. So we could very easily say, hey, anytime that a request comes into localhost 5000, redirect that request to 8080 inside the container. And like I said, this is actually something that we're going to do quite frequently in production applications. So now this is essentially saying, okay, browser is making request to 5000, redirect request to 8080 inside the container. Again, these two ports do not have to be identical. So let's try doing that again with the Docker run command. I'm gonna stop the thing by pressing Control C, and then we'll do Docker run dash P, and I'll say that I wanna map port 5000 on my local network to 8080 inside the container. And then I'll do Steven Greider, simple web. Okay, looks like everything started up successfully. Now if I go back over to my browser and I try to refresh localhost colon 8080, I'll very quickly see an error message. But if I instead go to localhost 5000, well, there's the node server. It is now 
taking traffic or incoming requests to localhost 5000 and redirecting them to 8080 inside the container. Now, last thing you might be kind of curious about, you know, this is kind of an obvious, but I'm gonna say simultaneously a silly question. Can we change the port inside the container? Well, yes, of course. We can change this to be, you know, 6,000, 7,000, whatever you want it to be. Just if you change the port inside the container, you need to make sure that your actual web server application, so inside my index.js file, we specified that our node application should listen on port 8080. So if you're gonna change the target port inside the container, well, of course, you gotta make sure that you change the port that your application is listening to as well. You, know, you would have to change this to 6,000 or 7,000 or whatever it might be. Okay, so that's it. That is port mapping in a nutshell. The one big thing to remember is that we have to specify it at runtime, not inside of the Docker file. So we've got one more step towards success. We are actually able to visit our running application inside the browser. So like I said, we were going to run into a handful of little errors along the way. We saw a case in which we were not copying over the package.json file. We saw using a bad base image, and we also saw a lack of port forwarding. Again, these are all little things that I kind of expect that you'll see as soon as you start using Docker on your own personal project. Now, even though our application is successfully running, there is one last little thing that I wanna point out. So we're gonna go over one last little fix in the next section. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. We're now successfully able to visit our running web application inside the browser, but there's one last little thing that I wanna point out. I'm gonna start my container up using the image that we've already built, but this time I'm gonna start up a shell inside the container so that we can do a little bit of debugging inside there. Remember that we can start up a shell inside of most Alpine-based containers by running docker run dash it, and I'll put down my container name of Steven Greider simple web, and then I will override the default startup command with sh. Remember, this is a reference to the shell program. It will start up a shell that we can type commands into inside the container. Now you'll notice that I did not specify a port mapping here. It's because we are not going to actually start up the server. I just want to attempt to look at the files and folders inside the container. So I'll run that and then we'll get a command prompt based inside of the root directory of the container. Now inside of here, I'm gonna print out all the available files and folders with ls. So inside of here, you'll notice that when we did that copy operation, we copied into the root directory or the root folder of the container. And so in this root directory, we can see the Docker file, a package lock.json file, which is automatically generated by NPM, package.json, index.js, and all of our installed dependencies were placed into this node modules folder. And again, these were all placed into the root directory of this container. Now this is definitely not the best practice. And the reason for that is that if we happen to have any files or folders that conflict with the default folder system, like if we have a folder called var or root or run or lib, super, super likely for us to have a folder called lib inside of our project, we might accidentally overwrite some existing files or folders inside of the container, which is definitely not ideal. So we're gonna make a little change to our Docker file and rather than copying everything directly into the root project directory, we're actually gonna copy everything into kind of a nested directory instead. Now, rather than just changing the copy command inside of our Docker file and saying, oh yeah, copy it into like some application folder or something like that, there's actually an instruction that we can use inside the Docker file that is specifically meant to address this whole issue right here of accidentally overriding files or folders by copying into a root directory. So let's take a look at what the instruction is. So we can add the work dir or work directory instruction into the Docker file and then pass a reference to a folder to it. Then any following commands or any following instructions we add to our Docker file will be executed relative to this folder. So in other words, if we add the work dir and then a folder above the copy instruction right here, it will make sure that we only execute, or excuse me, it'll make sure that when we actually do the copy instruction, it won't copy it into the work directory, excuse me, the root directory, it'll copy it into the directory that we have specified as the working directory instead. So let's try doing that right now. I'm gonna add in an instruction of work dir, 
And then we're going to use a folder of slash user slash app. So I'll say slash user slash app. If this folder does not exist inside the container, it will be automatically created for us. Now you might be curious as to why I'm using user slash app. Well, to be honest, in the Node.js world, it doesn't make a tremendous difference where you put your application into in a Linux-based operating system. There definitely are places you don't want to put it, but at the end of the day, the user folder is a safe place to put your application. It's specified as the location for all of user home directories. Essentially, it's an okay place for us to put our application. Now, as I say that, there's definitely a lot of Linux diehards out there who would probably disagree with me, and they might say, oh no, you should put this into var, or you should put it into the home directory instead. So there is some disagreement out there on where the best place is for your application, but I can just about guarantee you that if you put it into user slash app, you're probably gonna be okay. Okay, so now we've added in the workdir instruction. I'm now gonna save the Docker file, and then we'll flip back over to our terminal. I'll exit the running container, by typing in exit, and then we're going to make sure that we first rebuild our container, and then we will try to relaunch it. So I'll do a rebuild with docker build dot, oh, let's not forget to tag it, so docker build dash t, your docker id slash simple web, and then a dot, there we go. So we're going to rebuild it. Now one thing that you'll notice is really interesting, because we made a change, to an instruction above the copy and npm install, everything after that instruction has to rerun from scratch. So we cannot use any cached versions. In other words, the npm install command has to run again and reinstall all of our dependencies because we cannot use the cached version of that step. So we got our output here. Let's try starting up our container again. I'll first start it up in normal mode and try to visit it inside my browser. So we'll do a docker run dash p to set up a port mapping, and we'll map 8080 to 8080. And then the container that I want to run is Steven Greider slash simple web. So we'll run that. And then I'll go back over to my browser. I'll try to visit localhost 8080. And yep, it looks like we're good to go. I can refresh the page. And if we also try to start up a shell inside the container, we'll see that all of our project directories, or excuse me, all of our project files are no longer in the root directory. To do so, we can either rerun the docker run command with the it and sh attached to it, or we can use that docker exec command. You'll recall we can use docker exec to start up a second process inside of a running container. Let's try doing it that way just for a little bit of variety. So I will open up a second terminal window I'll get the ID of that running container by using docker ps. So here's the ID right here. And then we can attach to that container and start up a shell inside of it by using docker exec dash it, the ID of the container, and then the program that we want to run inside of it, which in this case is shell. Don't forget the IT right here is to attach standard in and a nice looking terminal to the shell that starts up. So I'll run that. And you'll notice that we enter directly in to the user slash app folder because we had set up that working directory previously. That workdir instruction right here not only affects commands that are issued later on inside of our Docker file, it also affects commands that are executed inside the container later on through the docker exec command. So if I now do an ls right here, I'll see all of my project files and folders nicely isolated inside of the single file and I can change back to my root directory by doing cd forward slash, print out all the files and folders there with ls, and I'll see that I do not have any possible conflicts going on. We have nicely spaced our application or kind of isolated our application into this folder right here. All right, so that's pretty much it, looking pretty good. Now, believe it or not, there is one last little thing that I wanna look at. So let's do one more quick break and we'll come back in the next section and do one quack, quick last little thing. So I'll see you in just a minute. There's one last little interesting thing that I want to show you about our current build process and the container that we're running out of it. I'm gonna start up my container very quickly with docker run. We'll do the port mapping again with 8080, 8080, and I'll do Steven Greider slash simple web. 
Okay, so we're running on port 8080. Now I'm going to again visit the application inside the browser. I'll refresh the page. Yep, everything's working as we expect. Now let's try making a change to the source code of our index.js file. I'm going to open up the index.js file right here. This is the route handler right here that is executed anytime someone visits the root route on our running server. And so as you can see, we are sending back a string of simply hi there. Let's try making a change to the string and then refreshing the page and seeing what happens. So I'm gonna change from hi there to by there. I know I'm not very original. I'm gonna save this file, it definitely saved. I'm gonna to go to file save, 100% save, no two ways about it. And then I'm gonna go back over to the browser and I'll refresh the page. And when I do so, you'll notice that we still see hi there appear on the screen. So what's going on? Well, remember, anytime that we create our image or create the container, we're taking a snapshot of the file system. So we took a snapshot of index.js after it got copied over. And we are running our application based on that old version of index.js. When we modify the index.js file inside of our current working directory right here, that change is not going to be automatically reflected inside of the container. If we want it to update the file inside the container, we're going to have to do some additional fancy configuration. We're not going to go through that configuration just yet. That's going to be something that we're going to address on the next application. But just so you're aware, yeah, changes we make here, not reflected inside the container. So what would we have to do to get our container to get this new file or to get this new change right here? Well, we would have to completely rebuild the container. We would have to rerun the docker build command and attempt to build it again, which is going to copy over the newly changed files, then run npm install, and then start our server up. Let's go through that process right now because there's one more little thing that I want to show you along those lines. Okay, so I'm going to stop my running server and then we'll do a docker build. We're going to tag it. And then I'll make sure that I do the dot to specify the build context. So I'm going to run that. And, oh, this is kind of interesting. I want you to notice something here. During step three, we are copying over all of our project files and folders, every last one of them. We just made a change to the index.js file. And Docker has detected that we changed one of the files that copy, was copied over during that step. Because we made a change to the step, this step right here, step number three, and every step after it has to be executed again. In other words, when we rebuild our container, we have to reinstall all of our dependencies, even though we very clearly did not make a single change to any of the dependencies inside of our project. And so I'm going to argue that that's probably not ideal. If we don't make a change to a dependency inside of the project, we probably don't want to rerun npm install. All we did was change one of the source code files of our project. And again, that has nothing to do with our dependencies. So I think that would be really neat if we could figure out a way to make sure that just by changing one of our source code files, we do not have to rerun npm install and install all of our dependencies again. Because even though this is only taking a handful of seconds right now, well, it's only because we have one single dependency. If you're working on a real application or a real project, it might take several minutes to re rerun the npm install command. And I would not want you to have to reinstall all those dependencies every time that you make a change to the source code of your project. So let's come back to the next section and we're gonna figure out a better way to handle copying over our project files and folders into the container. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we saw that making a change to our index.js file and then rebuilding the image caused the copy step to be completely invalidated. We had to rerun copy and every step after it, which means we had to sit through and wait for all of our dependencies to be installed through run npm install. So in this section, we're gonna to try to figure out a way to avoid having to completely reinstall all dependencies just because we made a little change to one of the source code files inside of our project. So here's what we'll do. We're gonna take our current build process inside of the Docker file, and we're gonna split the copy operation out into two different steps. The only thing that npm install right here requires in order to run successfully is the package.json file. That's all we care about. We don't care about the index.js file or any other file inside of here. So during this initial copy step, I'm gonna say the only thing that I want to copy is the package.json file. 
So I just changed the instruction right here. It now says, look in the current working directory or look in the directory specified by the build context argument of Docker run, or excuse me, Docker build, and find the package.json file. And then copy that into the current working directory of the container. We'll then rerun, or excuse me, we'll then run npm install. And then after we install all those dependencies, we'll copy over everything else. And so we'll do a copy dot slash dot slash like so. So think about what is going to happen now as you start to work on your project. You can make as many changes as you want to the index.js file, and it will not invalidate the cache for either of these steps right here. The only time that npm is npm install is going to be executed again is if we make a change to that step or any step above it. And so in other words, the really only effect this is going to have is if we make a change to the package.json file. That's really the only situation in which npm install will normally be executed again during the build process. All right, so let's try building this again and then starting the container up and just making sure that everything still works. All right, so I'm going to flip back over. I'll do a docker build dash T, Steven Greider, again, your Docker ID, not mine, simple web, and then we'll specify the build context with that simple dot. So I'm going to rerun this. Now we have made a change to the Docker file, so we are going to see some steps rerun, and then we eventually get our successfully tagged and built image. Now before trying to run it, I want you to run the same command a second time. So same thing, no changes whatsoever. So that time, it went extremely quickly because we were able to use the cached version of every single step. So now let's imagine that we are doing some normal changes to our application, and a normal change would probably be a change to the index.js file. So maybe we decide that we don't want to say buy there anymore. Maybe instead we want to send back, how are you doing? So we've now made a change to the index.js file, and we definitely need to rebuild our image because we do not have any support for kind of hot reloading of the index.js file or a project file into the container. So we have to rebuild the image. So I'll go back over. I'm going to rerun the same command for a third time. And we saw that it executed very quickly because the only change that we made to any step along the way was step number five. We copied over the entire contents of that directory. Docker detected that we made a change to one of those files. And so it reran that step and every step after it. But we did not have to rerun the npm install step and reinstall those modules, which would have taken you know, in our application, not very long, but in a real application, it could take several minutes to run. All right, so the real lesson to learn here is that yes, it does make a difference, the order in which you put down all these instructions into your Docker file. And wherever possible, it is kind of nice to segment out the copy operations to make sure that you are only copying the bare minimum for each successive step. All right, so that's pretty much it for this application. Now, I hope that it was not terribly annoying for me to show you kind of like some of the wrong way of doing things and then correct them along the way. I hope that it was kind of nice to see the error messages appear and see the changes that we made. Of course, we could have put the right Docker file together from the get-go, but I don't know, you probably may have not learned quite as much as seeing the errors occur and then fixing them in as they occurred. Now, I think this application has turned out pretty well, but it's definitely a very, very basic operation. So let's take a quick break right now. We're going to come back to the next section, and we'll start working on a much more advanced Docker project. So I'll see you in just a minute.